Lead paint is the stuff of nightmares when it comes to buying a home or raising children. Flakes of paint to inhaled or ingested, the hazards are clear. The lead's importance in society and the arts especially may surprise you. Lead white was popular because of its density. One good coat ensured even coverage, reducing the production time for painters. This meant profits, and when there's paint profits, there's me, your host, Michael. Thanks for joining me for this broadcast of Creative Hazard Storytime. Today we'll be uncovering the story of lead white, the most important white in art history. Lead white was common throughout antiquity. The Romans incorporated it into their plaster to get bright whites. The Romans incorporated lead into a lot of things, actually, one being their water systems. Theory has it, lead poisoning from corroded plumbing is one of the contributing factors to the fall of Rome. You know, a lot of this is starting to sound familiar, but that's just a theory, art history theory. And white lead was also simple to make. Theophrastus, successor to Aristotle, describes it in a paragraph. A big piece of lead as big as a brick is placed above some vinegar in a cask. When after about 10 days the lead has acquired thickness, the cask is opened and a kind of mildew is scraped from the lead, which the lead is repeatedly placed in this way until it is used up. The scrapings are pounded in a mortar and continuously strained away, and the white lead is the matter finally left deposited. Described online at naturalpigments.com, the Dutch method is a refinement of this process. Our lead white is made relatively small amounts according to the 16th century Dutch method, differing little to the stack process of history. This method for stack process is metallic lead in the form of strips is exposed for about three months in earthenware pots, which have a separate compartment in the bottom containing a weak solution of acetic acid. Vinegar. By using strips instead of one solid block, a large surface area is achieved, creating more lead flake in the process. The pots are stacked in tiers over a layer of horse manure in a shed. After the shed is closed, the combined action of the acetic acid vapors, heat and carbon dioxide from the fermenting manure, carbon dioxide in the air and water vapor slowly transform the lead to basic lead carbonate. While it's difficult to convey how beloved lead white was, the fact that the hazard is still sought out today should provide some insight. George O'Hanlon, technical director of naturalpigments.com, shares photos of their process in a forum post from 2007. Our lead white is made according to this manner in a carefully controlled environment to duplicate the method used by the Dutch and ensure the purity of the pigment. It is thoroughly washed to remove impurities in ground. Rublev colors lead white is a warm white of crystalline particles that vary greatly in size than the finely divided modern lead white available today. Now sure, we've all heard that lead is bad, and the pipes in Flint are bad, and the dirt in Gary, Indiana is bad, and so on and so on and so on and so forth. But can a little paint really hurt? Besides possibly bringing down the Roman Empire, it's difficult to tell on the consumer end. But there's definitely a sickness tied to all those who work with the paint. Known as painter's colic, the identification of the disease and its cause is chronicled through Dr. William Stokes' notes in the 1934 London Medical and Surgical Journal. I wish to say a few words on some cases of painter's colic which you have noticed in the wards. Painter's colic is a disease which is not uncommon in this country. During this season, we are seldom without a case of it in the hospital. But it appears to me that with respect to this nature, a great many erroneous opinions prevail. Now, colic is a form of abdominal distress, and you've probably already had it, because it happens to just about every baby adapting to eating outside the womb. Like everything else, breast milk and formula are foreign to a newborn baby, but this was painter's colic, a work-related disease. Babies don't work. This work-related disease was especially fearsome, with effects ranging from abdominal distress and blue lines on the teeth to blindness and paralysis. The colic aspect of painter's colic happened to be the most universal, which is where it got its name from. 
Despite all these symptoms, the prevailing notion was that colic was a blockage in the intestinal tract. Some persons maintain that it is a mechanical obstruction of the intestinal canal, depending on a spasm of the muscular fibers, and indeed, when you look at the affection superficially, this opinion seems very reasonable, for there is great pain, constipation, and spasms of the abdominal muscles, and contraction of the belly in general, which appears as if it was pressed backwards towards the spine. The treatment was a strange one. This doctrine has also been further countenanced by the occasionally favorable effects of remedies calculated to remove spasms, as hyosarcomus, opium, and tobacco. Another school of thought maintained that painter's colic was an inflammation of the lining of the intestinal wall. Dr. Stokes came to a different conclusion. There is no indication of an active inflammation of the digestive tube, and we have no fever present. Surmising there was no inflammation and this was actually an affliction of the nervous system made apparent from the extreme effects of the disease like blindness and paralysis, Dr. Stotes decided to experiment. We had a patient with painter's colic who was laboring under profound coma. I determined whether an opiate would increase or diminish it. From my strong suspicion that the coma was, like other symptoms of the disease, unconnected with congestion and inflammation. We gave him a full opiate in the evening, and the next morning he was found sitting up in bed, quite free from the coma, with his sight and hearing, which he had been deprived of, completely restored. So what did the experiments conclude? What then is the real nature of the disease? It appears that most likely to be a nervous affliction of the intestines, and it is also likely that the spinal system is also engaged. So, 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 mystery solved. In 1834, 143 years before lead paint was regulated out of use in the United States. And 173 years before George posted his little tutorial online. So why does its use continue today? Why can't artists and businesses let it go? Simply put, white lead made the best white paint. Nothing compares. Startling still is the thought that lead poisoning might be a factor in artistic genius. In a 2013 Atlantic article entitled, How Important is Lead Poisoning to Become a Legendary Artist? Ogla Kazan posits that very question. She quotes 18th century Bernadus Ramazzini, who noticed a trend in the symptoms of artists. Of the many painters I have known, almost all I have found unhealthy. If we search for the cause of the cathiotic and colorless appearance of the painters, as well as the melancholic feelings that they are so often victims of, we should look no further than the harmful nature of the pigments. Kazan's article describes the history of lead paint, including the destructive effects of lead poisoning before making a bold claim. In fact, the ailments that many renowned artists experienced didn't just prompt their gloomy works, they might have been caused by them too. Yet another toxic standard for aspiring artists to live down to. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this broadcast on white lead. It's really hard to fathom how hard it was for people to give up white lead when it was first regulated, but it certainly led to a healthier society. I'm making these videos to share what I know so that people can learn a little bit more about me in the process. I'm Michael, and I think it's important for artists to find a way to give back with their talents, which is why I started Died Famous. Our goal is to provide free, handmade portraits to families that have unexpectedly lost a loved one. I started drawing memorial portraits for grieving families because I've seen the impact a drawing can have on the bereaved. To learn more about this cause, visit Died Famous. That's it, just Died Famous. There, you'll see some of the portraits we made, read about who we are, and you'll find our other social links like Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and Patreon, a donation service where you can become a sustaining member and help us make more portraits, not videos, because I only do these to build a little bit more awareness around that project. If you want to join this list and support something a little bit different than video creation, head on over to patreon.com slash diedfamous. Special thanks to all our Patreons listed here. Your support makes this project sustainable and it really means a lot to me that you believe in what we're doing. So thank you a lot. If you like this video, check out the rest of the series. And if you made it this far, smash that like button right now. Like right, right now. It's going to help with that dreaded algorithm. And that's the thing that you got to worry about on the internet. Anyways, everybody, thanks again for watching. See you next time.